Hi, my name is Brandy Lee. My son Finn was treated at Mayo Clinic. He was diagnosed with recurrent rhabdomyosarcoma of the bladder and came here for surgery in 2018. I am here today with his pediatric urology surgeons, Dr. Patricio Gargoyo and Dr. Candice Granberg to discuss my parent experience. As a parent who's been through this process, I know firsthand how scary, stressful, and overwhelming it can seem. It is our sincere hope that these informational videos will assist viewers in making decisions about their own child's medical care and will help alleviate some of their fears. Dr. Gramberg and Dr. Gregorio, thank you so much for being here today and for dedicating your valuable time to this video project. What questions do you have for me? Well, thank you for being here today thank as you. well. Brandy Lee, let's start with finding a skilled and experienced rhabdomyosarcoma surgery team, especially with a complex case like a recurrent tumor like Finn's. Mm -hmm. You have mentioned this being an important aspect for you. How did you go about your research in finding us? We had actually been referred to talk to another doctor that knew about Dr. Arndt here at Mayo Clinic. And when we talked to her, she had already set up all of our appointments with you guys. We actually started doing research after we had the appointment with you, or before we had the appointment, but um, not we hadn't met with you yet. So we started doing research on your department and all that Mayo Clinic does, and we were absolutely blown away with how much you've done with Rabdo, and we once we met you, we knew we were in the right place. We just felt like it was a great match for us and for Finn. Great. The, with aggressive tumors after having radiation and sometimes previous surgeries, many people will be involved in the case, mm -hmm. working on their various areas of expertise, such as an orthopedic oncology surgeon to work around the bones, vascular surgeons to work around the vessels, pathologists looking at frozen section margins during the surgery, etc. Experience of these surgeons is extremely important. Describe what it was like to learn about the team that would be involved in Finn's care. My husband and I were completely blown away by the expertise of all of you and the entire team that you had put together. We hadn't even thought about needing vascular surgeons. Uh, we really had no idea the extent and the expertise that was needed for a surgery that Finn was about to receive. And you guys put our fears and all of our anxiety at ease when you talked about everybody that was going to be on the team and the world-renowned experts that were going to be in there operating on our sweet boy. It really was amazing to know that Mayo Clinic had all the experts in all the areas that was needed to, to make Finn surgery a success. Obviously, Randy, and again, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is a, a difficult time, and, and there's a lot of information coming at you when you have these complex consultations. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on, you know, taking notes during the appointment or having somebody there to write things down um, or, you know, potentially just having another person with you in the room to just keep track of all, all the information that's kind of being thrown at you? I think that is really, it's really important and it's a great idea. My husband and I were both there for the appointment, but if a family, if only one parent is able to come or one caregiver, maybe having a, a grandparent come along or a good friend who can keep notes so that the parent can just be present talking with you guys and kind of asking the questions that come up on the fly and also having somebody to help you write down questions beforehand that the parent might forget while we're in the consultation with you. It's a great idea. I know we didn't do this when, when you guys were here visiting with us, but you know we see parents all the time if they need to record mm -hmm. the information mm -hmm. just so they can have a little bit of uh, you know more input and things for the future to review, you know, we obviously never mind, but I know you guys didn't do that, but I would think that would be helpful also. Yes, we did actually, we had gotten your permission after you had completed Finn's surgery. Um, we recorded on our phone just with the voice memo 
you kind of recalling the surgery and all that you did, which was really helpful to go back to when we were trying to regurgitate it to other, you know, family members. And um, it's just a lot to remember and to keep track of. So Mm -hmm. that's really helpful, especially when you're trying to keep track of everything at such a stressful and um, (laughs) anxiety-provoking time. Mm -hmm. I know we had had some phone conversations with you because you guys live quite a distance away, and there were times where you would both be on the phone or be on speaker, and both of us would be on the phone on our end, and so having another ear to the phone to take notes is probably helpful as well. Absolutely, yeah. It's... It's always great to have multiple ears on the phone. Um, my memory is terrible, so I look to my husband to remember things, and then it was great to ask both of you because even though you're both you know, renowned experts and surgeons, um, it's just great to get both of, your, both of your input. I think males and females kind of approach answering questions and um, going into a major surgery differently, um, so it's, it's just wonderful to have all different perspectives on the phone and multiple ears listening and brains thinking. Mm -hmm. And what advice would you have for people watching this on being your child's advocate? Well, you're a fantastic advocate. So So I have a t-shirt that says advocate like a mother, but Mm -hmm. I think that you have to be your child's best advocate. Nobody knows your child better than you. Nobody knows their symptoms. And when the smallest thing is going on, you know your child the best. So you have to fight for your child and you can't take no for an answer. If you in your gut know that something is wrong, then you need to seek out the experts for what is going on and and get an appointment with them and talk to them. Um, somebody will listen. You just have to find that right person. And the, the people um, here at Mayo, I think personally for us, um, you guys were just incredible. And you really, um, you made such a horrible process just so amazing. It sounds kind of crazy to say that with a mm-hmm. cancer journey, but you really did. Yeah, that's, that's good to hear. And obviously, you know, with Finn and with other patients with randomized sarcoma, mm-hmm. there's so much testing that's involved. There's so much mm-hmm. pre-procedure planning that's involved. Um, you know, what would be your advice for other parents about just understanding what the testing is, asking questions, knowing what the surgical plan is going to be? Is that something that you and Dan felt comfortable coming into this with mm-hmm. us? And just, you know, what, what should people kind of look out for when they're trying to understand these tests and these complicated surgeries? I say definitely ask questions. Uh, You guys were fabulous at describing everything, but definitely asking questions and not being afraid to ask questions because we hear it all the time, no question is stupid. Um, But a lot of times us parents have never heard a lot of the terms that are being thrown around. Um, You might hear PET scan or proton radiation or HIPAC or all those different terms. And a lot of times it's the first time a parent is hearing it. So you can't be afraid to ask the questions, knowing that you guys are ready and willing to answer and to go in depth and give us all the information we need. Every corner, every turn, um, when Finn had proton radiation, you know, we were given information, but then nurses and doctors answered all of our questions. And um, I think Mayo goes above and beyond describing the things that are going to be done and and providing all of the treatment options that are on the table and and you have a lot of them (laughs) (laughs) and we for finn had 3d models created of Mm -hmm. his tumor and the surrounding structures to help us prepare for the surgical planning did you feel that those 3d models helped you and dan better understand the surgery and the structures that might be affected by the surgery the 3d models are amazing and extremely helpful. I think having that tangible model and actually seeing where exactly the tumor is from our perspective as parents was was really, really helpful. And I can't imagine from a surgeon's perspective mm-hmm. how much of an advantage that can give you at going into surgery. Not to mention, it's just a really cool thing that we got to take home and to have with us. And when we're sharing with friends and family, and even Finn, you know, we're showing him a picture and our other boys, it just was really cool to be able to have that. And just knowing that you guys can offer that is, it's truly, um, 
I guess it puts our mind at ease knowing that you're taking every step possible to give yourself the biggest advantage when you're going into surgery. Yeah, I mean, it, for us, from a surgical point of view, they're they're pivotal. You know, mm -hmm. we stop in the middle, we look at them. So, mm -hmm. but I know that you know for parents, it, it helps to understand these things. That's great. Absolutely. You know, something we we hear a lot, and we kind of love your thoughts on. You know, some of these thoughts and and, and surgeries, you know, require a lot of pretty significant reconstruction. Mm -hmm. From a urinary point of view, we see, and I'm sure you and Dan felt this way, but we see this from parents all the time, and that is, you know, the idea of, of their child losing their bladder, losing their prostate, and sort mm -hmm. of kind of, you know, how to live with an external appliance where, where urine might collect, whether it's a urostomy or a colostomy, mm -hmm. and, and just kind of your thoughts about that, because people are, <laughs> Understandably so, just extremely worried about the long-term life that their child's going to have with those devices. Mm -hmm. It definitely is so scary as a parent. And when Finn was first diagnosed with bladder rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, if someone would have said to us, we're going to take his bladder and prostate right now, I think we would have said, whoa, wait a second, what about chemo and radiation? Why can't we try that first? And that's exactly what we did. Um, to, to take the organs right away is very scary for parents. However, I often wonder if we should have done that in the first place. And I think it's so helpful to hear about other cases, even though parents might not want to hear it at first, it's so helpful to, from your perspective, the doctor's perspective, to share those stories with the parents, just to give us more background information on why you would advocate to take those organs, whether it be upfront as frontline therapy or halfway through therapy. Um, it's definitely something that needs to be talked about and parents need to be told the reality of rhabdomyosarcoma and why it may be important to take those organs sooner rather than later. And when we had the organs removed after the frontline therapy, Finn had multiple surgeries, but um, it was a little scary. We were able to sort of ease into it with just having his bladder and prostate removed first and get used to the urostomy. And then when he relapsed, we had to, you know, take the rectum. And um, so then he had two bags. But it was, I think you guys put our minds at ease and um, allowed us to not be afraid about it. Um, and honestly, your child's life is more important. That's something that I learned early on in treatment was that um, we, need to, we need to prioritize his life and bladder's a bladder, a rectum's a rectum and the bags are harmless and they make really cool belts. And mm -hmm. you know, you kind of get over that when you really look at how much of a beast rhabdo is. Now, we know the answer to this, but I think parents would really like to know, how did Finn do with his bags? Finn grew to love his bags. <laughs> he actually, he emptied his bag really two weeks after he had surgery with his bladder. We heard the toilet flush and he said, I did it. And we went running, expecting to find pee all over the floor. And he had emptied his bag on his own and he aimed it perfectly in the toilet and he didn't spill anything and it was really incredible. And he also, when he had two bags, he sat in the rocking chair one day and he made up a song and he said, I have two bags, I have two bags, one for my pee, one for my poop. And he, I hope that's okay to say on camera. <laughs> he just embraced them. That was, you know, it was normal for him. And I mean, we told him about tumor, his tumors and he really adapted so well. We fear as parents that they're going to, that they're gonna hate it. But honestly, it becomes a part of them and they don't even think twice about it. And then they'll make up a song about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're more resilient than we, we think and we're trying to make yes. decisions on their behalf and parents are trying to make decisions on their behalf. And mm -hmm. just like then he learned to love them. Yes. So as far as recovery time and preparing for a big operation and recovery, maybe in a town not close to home, mm -hmm. do you have any tips and tricks for parents as far as what to expect for the recovery period or how to prepare? Mm. 
That's a good question. So I think you need to not have any expectations. Just throw them out the window. I think every kid will recover differently. Uh, Finn had a little harder time recovering because he had to have a nerve and part of a muscle taken. Um, But honestly, once you get home and get settled and get into a recovery routine there, it just becomes... It just becomes second nature, I think. Um, You just get in the motion of doing everything. And then here, when we were at Mayo, everyone was so incredible with therapy coming by every day. And the nurses were truly incredible. You guys were so amazing coming by and just, uh, just allowing us to take it one day at a time and not being, not feeling like we had to get out of here at any point in time. Obviously, child care if they have other children at home and you're traveling it makes it a little tricky but the most important thing that we always kept in mind was how is Finn doing and you know we don't want to rush him too soon but we also want to push him just a little bit and they the kids kind of tell you when they're ready to make more progress or if they need to slow it up a little bit so yeah I definitely think the first thing is throw your expectations out the window and just take it one day at a time and they'll let you know. (laughs) So let's talk a little bit about, you know, post-operative appointments and post-operative care. You know, what were your thoughts going into your post-operative appointments or what do you think were some important things to to remember and to talk about with your care team and especially with you guys because you were coming obviously from a long distance. Mm -hmm. You know, did you have any problems arranging for any phone conversations, follow-up appointments, follow-up care? How did that go for you guys? That actually was really smooth for us. I think for us personally, a lot of it was just done right in the hospital. Uh, we had to go to a couple appointments physically, you know, navigate our way through the buildings to the appointments, but it really was very easy. You guys make it really easy to get to those appointments. and. Um, a lot of times when you're just hanging out while your child's recovering, you're mulling over questions in your head, and you guys check in quite often, so we never felt like we had to hold all of our questions and store them up for days. You know, you guys are, are very available, but those appointments are really helpful at just addressing what's going on currently and, and moving forward. So they, I think parents will just... Um, be able to take advantage of not only the post-operative time and recovery um, while they're in the hospital, but also at that appointment. It's a good, um, there's ample time, I should say, to, to you know, address all the, all the questions we have. And what would you say was a good source of emotional support for you and your family as you're going through not only the diagnosis, but decision-making process of, of coming to surgery and and going through scans and everything oh emotional support well my husband was definitely we were each other's rock Mm -hmm. and I sound like a broken record but you guys are for sure a a great emotional support we didn't want to rely too heavily on on you guys for that but there's just something about you being parents and knowing how difficult this is and being able to to put our fears at ease and we relied a lot on um, our family and our close friends the friends that were um, in family that were watching our other boys back home um, so it really is a huge community effort to be able to get through this and it's important to have your people around you mm-hmm. <laughs> Speaking of community and family, do you have any advice for either, you know, extended family members, friends of the family of, you know, how to, how to cope with this, you know, specific things about how to support people through this journey? <laughs> uh, because obviously, like you said, it kind of, it takes a village to, to get through this. And obviously yes. you guys have an amazing support network, which, you know, we, we are very <laughs> blessed to be a part of. But, but what other advice would you have to either family or friends? I think the big thing with uh, cancer families is, and especially because it's such a long journey, a lot of rhabdo cases, it's not just one year and you're done. Sometimes the kids recur and you're in this battle for multiple years. So it's a very long marathon and parents and caregivers are gonna need support and love 
throughout the entire time. A lot of times when a kid is diagnosed with cancer, everybody rushes in those first weeks and months, and then the help and the checking in stops or peters off, and parents are going to feel very alone. And so the most important thing is for the village to keep checking in, to know that even though your life is is going on and it's normal, the cancer family is still very much in the trenches and they need your love and support more than ever throughout the entire thing. Um, I think a lot of families that were just in community with the cancer families, they all talk about how lonely it is the further out you get um, from the diagnosis date. And we we feel almost forgotten. And it's not that people care any less, you just get busy because it is a long, kids are battling for a long time. And so a lot of times, all it takes is just showing up with a cup of coffee or just showing up to just listen to the, to the parents. Um, 